critical safety assessment of, uh, of uh, oligonucleotides with a focus on, on ASOs. Um, and uh, this is then my layout or presentation outline. Um, Petra, I get an echo. I'm not sure what that is about. Uh, let's see if I can. Okay, uh, Petra, can you still hear me because I got rid of the echo now? Please let me know if you cannot hear me. So the presentation outline, uh, I'll first give an introduction to preclinical safety assessment. I assume that I make the assumption that uh, uh, some of you are not toxicologists, so it's probably good to, to give you some context of this. Uh, then mention a little bit of oligospecific considerations, uh, talk about design, chemistry and sequence, uh, and then uh, preclinical safety findings and the mechanistic drivers thereof, sequence independent, sequence and hybridization independent, and sequence but uh, hybridization independent. I hopefully that will be clear when we get there and just a short wrap up and questions. So starting then with just introduction, intro, uh, introducing preclinical safety assessment in general, what is this? So uh, as you probably all know, uh, medicines needs to be both efficacious and safe. Um, and the preclinical safety assessment, uh, the, um, the purpose of that is really to identify and assess potential safety risk for healthy volunteers and patients when moving into the clinical studies. Uh, and, and regarding uh, safety assessment, uh, toxicity, there could be a lot of different things going on. In this bubble here, there's just a few uh, endpoints that, that have popped up in different uh, 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 toxicity studies. So for toxicologists, we, we don't really know in many cases what to find. So we need to kind of throw a quite a wide net. Um, which makes it quite frustrating sometimes, but also very interesting. Uh, it's also important to remember that uh, when we talk about uh, safety assessment uh, and, and risk, uh, it's really a function of not only what could happen, but also the probability of it, uh, of it uh, happening. So risk is really a, a function of outcome and probability. We'll come back to that. Uh, and the benefit risk uh, discussion is very much context dependent. It's about the severity of the disease, uh, about the patient population and the treatment alternatives. I will also come back to that. Uh, one can divide uh, uh, toxicity into two different buckets. Uh, one that is more target driven uh, or some like to call it exaggerated pharmacology. And the way we deal with this is the target safety assessment with experimental verification. And also then we have the chemistry part of it that is not, that's kind of could be independent of, of the actual target. So I will talk about both these things in the context of oligos. So uh, this uh, uh, drug discovery and development value chain, probably most of you seen in multiple different versions. Uh, as you know, it starts with a preclinical phase with preclinical discovery. Uh, and the preclinical development when you run the first uh, uh, safety assessment studies according to GLP, clinical development, and then uh, hopefully an, an approval with the life cycle management uh, phase after that. What I wanted to point out here is that uh, you, the project, for a given project, you make decisions that stick with you for, uh, uh, for the rest of the, the project's uh, life. Uh, normally, in most ways of uh, modern drug discovery, you, you kind of start with identifying a target. Uh, that is often the first decision you, you take, and, and then that's kind of locked for the rest of the remainder of the project. You then think, okay, how to really modulate this uh, uh, target? Uh, then you can choose different modalities, you can choose different chemistries, etc., etc. So that happens quite early on in the project and driven by uh, the type of, of target you have and also where it is expressed and, and, and et cetera, et cetera. And how do you want to modulate it? Activate, inhibit or whatever. Uh, the specific structure or sequence for, for oligos uh, follow a bit later on. You can lock that down a bit later. So if we display this more around uh, the number of compounds here, 
So this start early on in the process. You can screen, in the case of small molecules, millions of compounds in this high throughput screening. Uh, for oligos, it could be hundreds or thousands. And then you kind of, uh, there via various filters, the number of, of compounds really decrease until you, before you go into the uh, regulatory uh, studies where you normally only have one or perhaps two compounds going forward. Uh, so what, what happens then uh, at these different phases from a safety perspective? In the in the pre in this discovery phase here, you you normally run uh, non GLP studies. GLP stands for good laboratory practice, which is an, a way to really have good tracking of your your data. Uh, uh, but this is more kind of exploratory studies or more screening type of studies early on in the discovery phase, and that uh, you do that in silico, in vitro, and in vivo, mainly in rodents. Uh, the aim here is really to select the best compound and, and also to, uh, from a safety perspective, that has the best safety profile and also to understand potential target safety concerns. Uh, in the GLP phase, that then would start uh, when you have selected your compound. Uh, this is uh, uh, more extensive studies, uh, uh, more dose levels, more animals, etc but you also run some in vitro uh, uh, assays there as well. And the aim of these studies, there are different types of studies, uh, more general toxicity studies, repro studies, cancer studies, safety pharmacology studies, et cetera, uh, is really to document in, in a good and robust way, preclinical safety and DMPK profile th that uh, you need in order to, to um, file your, your regulatory, uh, your uh, cl uh, clinical trial application, and at the down the line for the regulatory approval. So it's really about identifying uh, from a safety perspective, which toxicities can we see with this molecule and at what exposure levels. So uh, that really takes me to a uh, concept of safety margin. You've probably heard of that concept before, but it's really important to remember that, um, that it's a function of efficacy and safety. So in this very kind of simplistic graph, uh, we have a, 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 an effect and exposure and, and the desired effect, the effect if it kind of follows this uh, sigmoid cur curve, uh, the effect needed for a given pharmacology, desired pharmacology will obviously vary uh, uh, depending on, on the biology. Some, for some uh, pharmacologies, perhaps an ED50 is okay, some others, ED90 or something like that, is, is required. Uh, if you then uh, add the safety studies to this, uh, they are hopefully then occurring at a higher exposure. So if you then have the undesired effect here in, in red, uh, there are then at least two terms that are quite important. Uh, you have uh, um, a level where you start seeing unacceptable toxicity that is an acronym for that, is lowest observed adver adverse effect level, LOL. But then you have an even more important uh, uh, point here is that uh, the, at the, the exposure levels where we actually uh, have um, only acceptable findings left, there could be changes. I mean, when you give animals a drug, there will be changes, but if they are regarded as, as acceptable, uh, then that uh, in that exposure level at those those group you set the uh, no observed effect level uh, to that dose level uh, or exposure level and this actually the ratio between the where you have the exposure and the dose of of the acceptable findings uh, that ratio to the desired exposure where you see the desired efficacy constitutes the safety margin so it's not, uh, you really need to think about, you should have a free dose level, that's uh, to the free dose level in your TOC studies, that's to, to, uh, to that uh, that you count your safety margins. Um, so, um, however, whether the this toxicity, because these are just, you know, a symbolic curves here, uh, and there could be a lot of different uh, undesired effects hidden here. Uh, and the size of this, that safety margin 
uh, really depends on, uh, on what type of toxicity you see and, and the project context, for example, the patient population to be treated. What do I mean by that? Um, the given, uh, so here is, is a kind of an attempt to kind of illustrate a level of concern for given toxicity. Uh, more impact would be that you could, uh, if you have an, a potential concern like a potential cancer risk, it's very difficult or almost impossible to, to kind of detect in, pre, in, in short term preclinical models. Uh, the toxicity is as an adverse effect in vital organs, for example, heart, lungs, liver, kidney, and CNS. That's a lot worse, uh, 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 considered a lot more worse from a, a risk assessment perspective than if something would happen to non-vital organs. If your finding is irreversible, uh, that's regarded a lot more impactful than reversible. If it's not possible to, to monitor this in the clinic, it's also regarded to, to be a bit worse. You need to have a bit bigger margin. margin. And it can also be that it may not be a, a safety finding per se, but it will not be tolerated by the patient population. That would also then, you would like to have a safety margin, a margin that is sufficiently large. So you reduce the likelihood of that happening uh, for moving the project forward. Again, uh, risk is then the probability times the outcome in perspective of the project context. So I now come to my last slide here of um, of more of the general uh, terms here. But the project context, I mentioned that several times. And, and the thing is that this is quite important. And, and I hopefully will be clear why I talk about that in the, in the context of oligo safety. Uh, the thing is that here is, is an iron channel. And, and, uh, but regardless, it's, it's symbolizing, a, uh, it could symbolize a, a just a, a set of finding a biology that we have uh, and an interaction of a drug. Uh, in pro project context A, we, we're go going after a non-lethal disease. There are a lot of alternative treatments available, lifelong duration of the treatment, and you treat both sexes from early adolescence, and you need to go systemic for uh, perhaps including CNS for the pharmacology to kick in, and you have a very long half-life anticipated. A given set of findings here may say, well, in this context, the findings we see in the TOC studies are not uh, good enough to progress this compound. However, if you have a different project context, the same TOX findings, but you have a lethal disease, there are no other treatment options, short durations, perhaps it's very old patients, uh, and you have local topical exposure sufficient, so you will not go systemic, and perhaps you, you have a short half-life anticipated. Uh, then perhaps in that context, uh, uh, it's fully acceptable to have those, those findings. Uh, so in this context, I will come back to that as well. The many therapeutic oligo projects to date uh, has been to more rare disease with very few treatment alternatives. Uh, yes. So some um, uh, oligo specific considerations. Uh, oligo, uh, I should say that where I come from, I come from the small molecule area uh, and many toxicologists do. Uh, there are a, a number of things that you kind of learn there in, in the small molecule toxicology uh, education, etc. Uh, and there's a lot of assays for, uh, for small molecules that have been established and, and asked for by authorities. Uh, however, as, as most of you on this call probably know that this big difference between small molecules and, and, uh, uh, and, um, and oligos uh, in a number of parameters. Uh, making them not uh, the same as small molecules. Uh, however, I would say that the way that oligos are being risk assessed uh, uh, is follows the same principles as small molecules, but there are different areas of focus, different approaches you take, and you have different screening cascades. So uh, some oligo uh, specific considerations here. Uh, at least uh, four here that I'm going to talk about, and that's a platform approach, just mention it a little bit. 
those of you that are involved in, in uh, uh, therapeutic oligos, uh, you're probably aware about the, how oligos are being uh, uh, selected. Uh, there is a screening phase here where you uh, really kind of I try to identify uh, with quite often a relatively locked design and, and chemistry, try to identify the right sequences uh, by, by screening a number of, 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 uh, of compounds. Uh, I would say that compared to small molecules, the platform approach uh, that gives oligos of a certain class uh, quite um, similar uh, type of properties uh, you, makes you understand what to look for. For example, for single-stranded ASOs, it's, it's uh, one of the key areas you need to look into is, for example, liver toxicity. Uh, you know, to, you know that that's something you need to screen for, uh, and that's that's comes back in in most of the programs, regardless of the target, uh, and so on. So, so you can make some assumptions. You can I shouldn't say you take shortcuts, but you can you can make some assumptions in your screening design. You can keep your 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 uh, screening cascade quite very much the same to identify the compounds. Uh, which is not really the case for small molecules. And I think that's a great advantage, uh, making the, the, the discovery phase uh, uh, very streamlined. We also have the, the, the part of the patient context and regulatory landscape, will come, which I will come to in the next slide. And, and then toxicities of concern, which is going to be the bulk uh, that I will end off with. So, um, as I mentioned, there are small molecules. Uh, I come from a small molecule. I started as a small molecule toxicologist. And then we had a lot of things in this black box here that we, we had to worry about. HERG is an ion channel in the heart. Uh, the molecules should not hit that. There were automated uh, ion channel screening developed. Secondary pharmacology, we, we sent, submitted compounds into panels of, of uh, off-target uh, assessment, if you like, or secondary pharmacology screening cardiovascular safety, a lot of tests uh, for that, CNS, genotoxicity, reprotoxicity, fetal toxicity, et cetera. These things that, we, that are very, relatively common for small molecule pro programs, uh, I would say that unless target driven, uh, these are not really observed with, uh, with oligos to my, my knowledge. Uh, which is of course very, very good because uh, we, we don't need to um, it's about the distribution and the mechanism of action and, and the chemistry and so on. So these things are we don't uh, are not of any major of any concern for for oligos, uh, which is a good thing, as I said. Uh, however, all of those small molecule in vitro assays for for safety that have been developed to assess these things, they are obviously not meaningful to run uh, then. So we need to in invent uh, other ways of, of uh, uh, selecting our compounds. Uh, so patients and regulatory context, uh, I mentioned that. Uh, and uh, in several of those uh, uh, approved oligos uh, to date, uh, the number of patients uh, in those uh, uh, regulatory studies have been relatively few. Uh, in the hundreds, perhaps up to thousand or so, uh, in many cases for rare orphan disease. However, now with some of the compounds moving forward, uh, the number, uh, the range of patients being uh, uh, in focus uh, has changed quite a bit. It's expanded in both directions. You have probably heard the story of uh, Milasen, uh, this rare genetic disease uh, where it, uh, it was one patient, uh, a girl, as said, a kind of CNS deterioration, and within a very, very short time frame, um, uh, uh, the lesion was identified. It's a genetic uh, um, uh, lesion that could be corrected then by, by an, an oligo. Uh, but that was a unique uh, 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 mutation for her. So, so this uh, ASO that was developed for her is only going to be for her. So it's, it's super highly personalized medicine. Uh, that's on one end of the scale. Uh, and it was demonstrated that that could be done. Uh, to the other end of the scale now, when Inclisiron coming out for, uh, uh, for PCSK9 uh, siRNA, uh, 
uh, that has the potential to treat millions of patients. And of course, going from a few hundreds to thousands where you have uh, uh, no or only very few alternative treatments to uh, uh, enter areas where you expose a lot of, of other patients with uh, alternative treatments. Uh, that's, of course, uh, a big thing uh, uh, for, uh, where they need to be very, very safe. And also this with uh, 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 N equals one, that will put a lot of, uh, uh, I would say, uh, challenges to, to the regulatory authorities. But of course, they, I think they are um, very constructive in trying to help out there. Um, so uh, in the past, uh, at least from the publications and, and the, the oligos that have been uh, reported, published on, uh, then has been mainly been single stranded uh, uh, MO ASOs uh, in more advanced clinical studies. However, with the recent approvals of, of SIRNAs and, and a lot more in the pipeline with other chemical modifications, and we have antimicronase and myrmimics and, and also conjugates be, beyond GALNAC, the variety of, uh, of the oligoformats will increase a lot uh, going forward. Uh, with regard to guidelines, uh, there are no formal guidelines specifically devoted to oligonucleotides. Uh, so the regulatory interactions are mainly supported by publications and white papers uh, submitted by like OSWG, Oligo Safety Working Group. And there is a current discussion going on whether there is uh, a need for formal guidelines or not. So if I go to that part here about the regulatory environment, uh, that uh, this is a highly regulated area uh, with former guidelines from, uh, in general, from ICH, FDA, EMA, etc., for pharmaceuticals in, in uh, at large. Uh, oligos are chemically synthesized and thereby classified as small molecules. And as I mentioned, there are no specific former guidelines that specifically uh, describe oligonucleotide therapeutics. So instead, as I mentioned before, that. Uh, much of the kind of the best practice work is based on uh, or kind of guided, it's not formal guidance, but but uh, facilitated by publications from, for example, Oligo Safety Working Group. Uh, and they have submitted or published several papers in a lot of areas, inhaled, hybridization dependent off target, etc. here. And there are um, subcommittees in OSWG currently working up new white papers on areas such as DMPK, anti-drug antibodies, carcinogenicity testing, and off-target updates as well. So this is a, a really good and a helpful um, uh, source if you want to learn more about some of these certain areas. Uh, also another, uh, er another meeting point I would say that is, is highly valuable is the biannual DIA FDA meeting in in the Washington DC area, was one now in uh, November or late October last year, uh, where uh, industry and uh, some academics uh, meet up with uh, mainly FDA folks, uh, regulators in the area, discussing various topics. We also uh, formed a, a small oligo working group within the FPA, European Federation of Pharmaceutical Industries and Associations, doing some work in this area. So uh, the regulatory landscape will really it changed uh, at the DIA FDA meeting uh, in, in late October last year. There were quite a few of discussions around this. Uh, the Japanese authorities are, are drafting, and it might be uh, official now, an, an oligo uh, therapeutic guideline. Uh, there were a lot of discussion around a new ways of, of thinking around off-target analysis. Uh, the FBA group have made up, uh, produced a survey where it was quite clear that most many companies are asking for uh, improved guidance. Uh, and it's also clear that there is a different level of experience and views between uh, authorities. Also a an, an request from FDA to get the public views on, on things like drug-drug interactions, anti-drug antibodies, QT prolongation assessment, and also studies with liver and kidney organ impairment. So there is a lot of things that are being uh, bubblers in the kind of uh, regulatory space that that uh, uh, one need to perhaps need to kind of consider for for preclinical as well uh, in the preclinical assessment. 
but uh, time will tell. So going more into to, uh, the preclinical safety assessment and the impact of design, chemistry and sequence. Uh, so this is my version of, of uh, illustrating two different buckets of uh, uh, nucleotide-based drugs. Uh, we have the bucket of hybridization dependent uh, uh, nucleotide uh, drugs uh, where we have the siRNA, microRNA uh, and the ASOS, the single-stranded ASOS which all have different uh, mechanisms, RNA-SH dependent gap mirrors, antimers, splice modifying, and I think also we could have the precision genome editing uh, like guide RNAs for uh, CRISPR-Cas9 uh, into this bucket as well. However, there are, are nucleotide-based drugs that are uh, not dependent on hybridization in the same, uh, in the Watson-Crick hybridization, uh, where we have aptamers and immunostimulatory oligos and, and mRNA. Uh, so, uh, my focus will be on uh, on ASOS in, in this presentation because that's where I have my own most uh, experience. However, I need this is kind of the place where to mention that there are differences here in, in the design. The siRNA and the microRNA mimics, they are double-stranded. Uh, there are few uh, and sometimes no phosphothyrate linkages. We'll come back to the importance of, of, of PS linkages. And they often required some kind of formulation, either some LMP or, or some kind of conjugate for efficient delivery. There are also examples where you can deliver it locally as well, that, that works. But for more systemic delivery toward tissue, tissues, uh, you, you, I think the, the area is moving more towards now conjugates like, like ALNAC. Uh, for ASOs, they are single-stranded. And they, in most cases these days, uh, full phosphothyrate backbone administered in saline, uh, and as with the uh, uh, siRNA, the conjugates, for example, again, like they enhance potency and reduce the overall dose. So my, my talk will mainly be here about this, but I will also mention uh, uh, some, some aspects of, of, of siRNA as well. Uh, this is about the sequence, uh, and uh, this is an illustration from an ASO screen where uh, you have perfect homology uh, of all the ASOs to, to the target uh, mRNA. So this is a GAPMER uh, assay for knockdown. Uh, and as you can see here, it's a pretty big variability in the, in the knockdown efficiency uh, between the different sequences, uh, despite all these being perfectly uh, homology matches. Uh, so that means that uh, just perfect homology is not enough for potent ASO activity. Uh, and of course, one could think that this is, is um, mainly a, a problem for, for potency and, and let's screen and, 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 and um, um, let's, let's screen for it to get the most potent, but it also has a consequence for, for species differences and also uh, in silico uh, of target analysis. Uh, I think it, may be difference. Uh, well, it is a difference here that for uh, the, my experience of ASOS is that it's quite, uh, sometimes you can have a good potency uh, cross-reactivity between monkey and, and human, but uh, uh, rarely, uh, there are some examples, but rarely uh, um, good potency on human and good potency on, on the rodent uh, uh, target RNA. Uh, I've heard from several sources that in, in sRNA, I think they try to have a bit more um, uh, cross-reactive compounds if possible. Uh, and being a more kind of a, uh, a protein complex that uh, you, you may have a, a bigger chance there to, to, to get cross-reactive compounds across the species. Reason for this being important is that uh, uh, um, you, you need to address the target safety uh, in your regulatory studies. Uh, so you, I, you, you need to uh, have an, an ASO uh, with the same format that, that uh, knock down at least one of the species that you, you, you test. Uh, so, and it's also around the uh, in silico of target analysis. One could think that uh, of target analysis is, is quite straightforward. You just do an in silico analysis and everything that is uh, uh, homologous or, or within certain rules, uh, that's going to be an off-target. But uh, uh, when you actually do assess those 
uh, you, you get a pattern like this, that, that many of the potential off-targets identified in silico, they will not uh, be active in uh, uh, when you do run the experiment. So another aspect here is about the uh, uneven distribution. Uh, and this uh, really goes for the phosphothyrate, uh, uh, the single strand of phosphothyrate backbone ASOs, that you have a quite restricted uh, distribution uh, where the proximal, uh, the cortex of the kidney, the proximal tubular cells there, uh, or in most cases, or the, the cells that uh, where you can find the highest concentration of PS backbone ASOs, but also in the liver. But if, within these tissues, uh, there are, even if you, these are the organs where you find uh, the highest concentration, there's a difference in, in, uh, uh, in the concentration depending on cell types. So in liver, even though we normally have the best uh, uh, Gapmer activity in hepatocytes, uh, it's really the, the liver sinusoidal uh, endothelial cells and Kupfer cells that have the highest concentration. So uh, this is, and there are several tissues uh, where when you give this systemically, the ASO uh, systemically, where the ASO doesn't reach at all, for example, uh, very, very limited exposure, if any, into the CNS, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, it's important to, here to think uh, uh, about the, this concept of productive uptake. Is really the uptake of, of, of ASO that leads to pharmacologic effect. Uh, in, in these cases, the target mRNA uh, knockdown. Uh, and at a given cellular concentration, this, this can vary quite a bit between cell types uh, and, and also uh, between in vivo and in vitro. Uh, it's also important to remember that, that even though we have accumulation in the kidney and, and in the liver, uh, unless uh, you, you go up in very, very high doses in your TOC studies, uh, this uh, accumulation and, and uh, higher concentration in these tissues is not toxic per se. However, if you have a sequence that is, is prone to give toxicity, to in induce toxicity, there will obviously be a dose dependent relationship that the higher concentration in the tissue of that toxic ASO will lead to more toxicity. But the to accumulation per se is not regarded as, as, as toxic. So uh, just to summarize some, some of the aspects that I touched upon partly uh, already. That RNAs H gapmers are often poor uh, species cross reactivity. So in, in several of the uh, regulatory studies, uh, it's, it's uh, quite common to include a rodent active surrogate uh, of the same chemistry and design just to assess the on-target safety part in a, in a GLP setting. Uh, it's also important to, to consider here where the target is expressed and what level of activity is needed for the pharmacological effect. If you remember my, my graph there of, uh, of the safety margin, uh, so really deciding as early as possible uh, how much of the pharmacology do you need in the case of GAPMERS, how much knockdown do you need in a given cell, uh, that will really dictate how, how much, uh, 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 what dose of a given ASO you will need to give. And of course, if you have an, an organ that have a relatively modest up to productive uptake, uh, let's say like the heart or, or uh, adipose or skeletal muscle, etc., you may need to compensate for the uh, modest productive uptake by increasing the dose. And, and that will then uh, obviously give uh, a higher, uh, uh, with the uptake being uh, not compound specific, but rather chemistry specific, you will, that will also give you quite a lot of uh, uh, uptake into liver and kidney as well, and other tissues. Uh, there are a restricted number of tissue cell types where uh, uh, that actually, at mean it relatively uh, a clinically relevant doses will take up enough oligo uh, uh, to constitute a true target safety concern, i.e. that the knockdown in this case with GAPMERS will be uh, sufficient enough to, to constitute an effect uh, or a concern. Uh, something that is quite important uh, for oligos and, and uh, for, uh, 
for the GAPMERS or, or the ribose modified uh, oligos, and, and I would say especially for siRNA having a very, very long effect duration. Uh, that is uh, the very long effect duration, uh, obviously is very good from a, a dosing regimen perspective, uh, but should something go wrong uh, with that, uh, uh, and this being driven by the, uh, the effect that the compound has in that tissue, for example, on or off hybridization dependent off target, uh, there will be a quite a long uh, wash up period before you can get rid of the, of the drug. So uh, with ASOS having, at least for the liver, having a, a tissue half-life of around three to five weeks, and siRNA even longer. Uh, this, of course, is something you need really need to to consider. Uh, if we then so that was more around the target safety exaggerated pharmacology considerations. If we then look at the chemistry slash compound safety, uh, I mentioned this before about more the platform re uh, approach. Uh, and I should say that within an ASO class, I will soon come to those classes with the chemistry and design and so on. The safety spectrum or class effects, if you like, is relatively well understood. So it means that you you uh, you can you understand what you know what to look for, which means that you can have a relatively streamlined, I shouldn't say easy, but streamlined uh, screening cascade and uh, focus your uh, your screening on fewer endpoints than you may need to do for small molecules. Uh, it's also these things with about the platform that adverse findings for one sequence can have a percept uh, imp perceptional impact on the entire class. Like if something goes wrong uh, uh, with a gap race or an siRNA, some investors may think, well, hey, this is uh, something wrong. It may be something wrong with the entire class. Uh, and that is most uh, often uh, not the case since the sequence is quite important here in, in most uh, cases. Uh, Another thing here is about, as I mentioned, that compared to small molecules, there are limited availability of predictive in vitro models. There are examples of some, uh, there are publications coming out during the recent years where there is a, a, a showing good uh, correlation between in vitro and in vivo with regard to safety screening. But uh, so far, it's mainly for, for the liver uh, toxicity. Uh, hopefully this will develop over time so we, we can uh, do uh, more and more screening in vitro rather than in vivo. Uh, another thing is that uh, there has for quite some time been insufficient data to build predictive in silico models. Now when things are getting more and more mature and more and more compass have been put through, I think there is uh, also an emerging uh, set of data published and unpublished in, within the companies where we can actually start building uh, predictive in, in silico models, which will also be very helpful. And here's the last thing here about the, the potential, in, in theory, doing the in silico approach, all potential, hy potential um, hybridization dependent off targets could be identified and assessed. Uh, and, and I would say this is in contrast to small molecules where you can rely on the panels to which you were, uh, that are included when uh, in, uh, in the companies where you do the screening. Uh, so, so this is, uh, I think, is is good, but it also is uh, uh, can be quite uh, overwhelming uh, uh, that you can uh, theoretically identify all of them. So, uh, chemical modifications uh, having an influence on, on the safety uh, there or um, three areas where you, uh, main areas where you can make chemical modifications. One is in the backbone here uh, and the phosphothyrate backbone. I, this is probably the uh, one of the very most important uh, chemical modifications. It's, it's an old one, but it uh, allowed uh, really the oligos to go in vivo. Uh, it improves nuclease resistance and, and uh, uh, improve PK properties in vivo, but it also results in some decreased affinity to the target RNA. Uh, for the single-stranded ASOS, it's really the main driver for the ADMA properties, where it goes and how it behaves both in the circulation uh, and, uh, and in, uh, in uptake uh, into cells and also where it goes in, uh, in, within the cell. There has been several papers recently <coughs> published on the importance of the phosphothyrate backbone in, in uh, interaction with different proteins. 
Uh, so if you move away from the backbone, and, and this is going to be very important um, uh, for, also for the safety part here. Uh, if you then move away to other modifications, you can uh, uh, very uh, common modifications in the two prime position here of the ribose, uh, where we have uh, mo or methyl fluoro and C at an LNA uh, uh, modifications. Uh, these uh, really provide, uh, in most cases, further uh, improvement of the nucleus resistance, thereby giving uh, extending the half life of the uh, of the oligos, but also increase affinity to the target RNA. So increasing the potency of the of the uh, uh, of the oligo. Uh, here is also depicted uh, conjugates that can be added to uh, to the five prime end or the three prime end. Uh, Galnac is uh, uh, as probably all of you heard of, uh, and which is was a really a, a big breakthrough uh, in delivery of both siRNA and, and, and ASOS, improving the potency for hepatocyte targets uh, many many fold. Uh, so so this is an, an, uh, also a very very important uh, uh, chemical modification. Oops, I need to press the right button there. Uh, so. Uh, just mention about this uh, safety margin for conjugates. Uh, here we have the, the same graph as before. Uh, and if we have a Galnac, for example, a Galnac conjugate, uh, that means that you have you can have um, a lot more potent compound. So you, you, you give a, a lower, uh, administer a lower dose, and you can still get uh, 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 the same desired effect at a lower dose. Uh, this is wrong and exposure should uh, should be something else. But let's say exposure in plasma. Uh, and, and this is great because if you have uh, if you have a um, safety uh, finding that is, for example, driven by the plasma exposure, if you give tenfold lower of the oligo, then the, the safety margin will be uh, when if the exposure is going to be tenfold lower with uh, and still get the pharmacology in the liver, then of course your safety margin is going to be tenfold better then. Uh, however, if you have the safety finding is actually driven by uh, in your target organ, uh, if the safety comes from the hepatocyte, for example, then if you, uh, if you would um, even though you would give a lower dose, uh, the exposure in the hepatocyte giving a, a certain pharmacology would probably still be the same. So, so you wouldn't gain much. So talking about the conjugates and whether it will change the safety profile or not has to consider what type of safety we're talking about. So for example, for on-target uh, safety for hepatocytes, if something could go wrong if you would exaggerate the pharmacology on hepatocytes or have an off-target effects there, uh, that would not be helped by the, uh, the Galnac chemistry, uh, Galnac conjugation, but other things out in circulation would. So that's just my a comment there. But I think it's really a revolution, uh, the conjugations. So here is an, uh, a menu of different uh, two prime uh, modifications uh, as well as the phosphothyroid backbone. Uh, and, and here's just a little, some comments around the properties. I mean, there have been written papers of all of, of these. Uh, I, sh I will focus on, uh, for ASO perspective here, on the, uh, the MO chemistry. It's sometimes referred to as generation two chemistry. It really adds nucleus resistance and it's been used in large number of, of, of clinical trials. Uh, that has then been uh, in, in many of the uh, single-stranded uh, ASOs been uh, complemented by bridge nucleic acids like LNA and, and the CET. Uh, these uh, have higher uh, affinity uh, than, than the MO chemistry. Uh, and the optimal uh, length uh, goes from uh, 20 mer with a MO chemistry to, to short ASOs like 14 to 16 mer nucleotides. So they are higher potency on targets, but uh, partly due to their shorter uh, length, they also have uh, more prone to uh, give increased off targets. I should also mention the, the O-methyl uh, RNA and the fluoro, which is uh, uh, very, very common uh, substitutions in, in the siRNA. Uh, the more modern siRNAs, they are heavily modified with also some PS backbone 
modifications in, in the ends, uh, giving them better uh, nuclease resistance there as well. So uh, preclinical safety findings, what can we see with, uh, uh, with ASOS primarily, but also with some other oligos? We have sequence independent findings and sequence dependent findings. Uh, sequence independent findings in this bucket or is activation of alternative complement pathway. This is mainly seen in non-human primates. I will come back to that. We can also see prolongation or the co uh, coagulation time. And on histology slides, you can see uh, signs of oligo accumulation, for example, in the renal tuber epithelium and histiocytes in multiple tissues. These uh, accumulation effects are in most cases uh, not uh, associated with any degenerative changes and regarded as more as a kind of exposure effect rather than, uh, uh, than a toxicity. So the, the way to, uh, is, as I said, this is really, uh, well, I, I didn't say that, but uh, these effects are really driven by the phosphothyroid backbone and the coagulation prolongation and, and complement activation is really driven by the plasma Cmax levels. Uh, and this can be mitigated by having, uh, uh, trying to have a low dose or a dosing regimen that keep the, uh, flatten the, the Cmax curve, or flatten the Cmax level. Uh, for example, I, uh, IV bolus versus subcutaneous or, or longer duration bolus, uh, longer duration intravenous administrations, then you can get rid of, of complement activation and so on. Uh, or at least minimize this. Uh, but then we have the sequence dependent uh, uh, um, air, uh, findings where we have off target uh, uh, for ASOR and aherbalization dependent. We have pro inflammatory effects that are flu like symptoms, injection site reactions, development of anti drug antibodies may not be a safety concern, but, but is something that, uh, uh, that could happen. Uh, and also thrombocytopenia. We, uh, also have liver toxicity and kidney toxicity. And just a reminder, these are uh, tissues where we have really high concentration. So ways to, to mitigate this is really trying to keep the doses low, as low as possible, uh, especially for the, I would say, for the pro-inflammatory effects, but also a very, very stringent safety screening, trying to, to, to filter out those sequences and perhaps chemistry combinations that, that are more prone to give uh, uh, give these effects. So this is one way of also uh, uh, talking about this, about sequence dependence or not. Uh, and I had to show it because it's, it was in kind of in the webinar uh, intro. But I have actually modified that a bit to, to kind of divide it into three different buckets. Uh, one here that I just mentioned about sequence independent, uh, driven by PS backbone, coagulation time complement and accumulation. Uh, and then we have the sequence and RNA uh, hybridization dependent. That's on target safety and off target, sa uh, off -target uh, uh, hybridization dependent uh, uh, toxicities. Uh, I would say this is mitigated by kind of do, making a target safety assessment and in silico RNA seq analysis. And then we have the, the, the third bucket here, which is sequence but not RNA hybridization dependent effects, liver toxicity, kidney tox, and pro-inflammatory uh, findings like injection site reactions, flu like symptoms, thrombocytopenia, and anti-drug antibody generations, where we really mitigate in vitro and uh, by in vitro and in, in vivo screening. So uh, one slide on sequence independent uh, effects, and that is uh, for, from an example from the complement activation. So, uh, a series of publications uh, some years ago uh, really demonstrated that this is uh, a monkey, uh, mainly a, a challenge in the monkey uh, that is much more sensitive to, to this than, uh, than, for example, humans. Uh, approximately 10 times more sensitive when you uh, compare in, in vitro plasma. Uh, it's also a consequence of the number of phosphothyrate uh, uh, bindings. So here is a graph where we have different uh, length of, of, um, of PS uh, ASO, same sequence, uh, where you have the complement activation uh, correlates very well with the number of PS uh, bridges. So down here is an uh, in vitro uh, data from an in vitro uh, model uh, where you can see uh, where chemistry also plays a role. Uh, 
the the sequence here with the chemistry is only the PS backbone give the highest complement activation. If you add uh, more uh, uh, modifications to this uh, sequence, the complement activation actually goes down in magnitude. And if you further remove some of the PS bridges uh, uh, by and replace it with PO, it goes down even further. So PS backbone, but also the ribose modification uh, can play an important role here. Moving on to sequence and hybridization dependent findings. Uh, that is then on target, but also uh, off target. So the on target safety uh, is really exaggerated pharmacology. And the way you kind of uh, try to understand that is, is really compile a lot of information around uh, the safety of that or, or, uh, potential safety concerns from the target, target distribution, biological role, cell, uh, if uh, effect of competitor compounds, what happens if you knock it out, etc. Uh, and then you need to remember that ASOS oligos have restricted distribution, but also have long effect duration. I use this in order to make a target risk, a target safety risk assessment in the context of the of the project, as we talked about before, indication, treatment duration, etc. And uh, really try to assess is this a problem for this modality by using uh, uh, by running experiments, high dose experiments uh, with mainly, I would say, rodent active uh, ASOs. Uh, so that's on target safety concern. The off target uh, uh, safety concern then from hybridization dependent uh, uh, perspective is uh, uh, mainly regarded as a concern for oligos with catalytic mechanism of action, for example, RNAs, h gapmer ASOs and siRNA. Uh, and uh, for the single strand ASOs, there hasn't for a long time, this was more like a box ticking exercise with a more the medium affinity chemistry, uh, like the, the Mo chemistry. But with the LNA and C at higher affinity chemistry, this has become a, a bit more of a challenge. Uh, this may partly be that, the opt as I mentioned before, the optimal uh, length of, of, of these uh, more high affinity ASOs are more like uh, uh, 12 to 16 nucleotides long rather than 20. So really, the, the way you do this is that you, uh, the, at least the classical one uh, described by uh, Lindov et al, is you have an in silico search of the entire transcriptome. Uh, you then run an in vitro assessment where you, in cells where you have both your primary target and your, your potential off target uh, expressed and see what if you have a, uh, what's your safety margin then in, in that cell type that cell line of knockdown uh, and it, for those remaining you can make a theoretical off target safety assessment like you would do for the on target safety assessment and if it's still like of, of concern then you can run experiments with uh, uh, oligos uh, targeting uh, the off target i need to speed up here i realize uh, so here we have sequence but hybrid uh, sequence dependent but hybridization independent uh, these are really the, uh, the uh, pro-inflammatory effects. Uh, the CPG motifs probably all of you have heard of, and it's Art Krieg, he, he defined this in the 90s. Uh, and uh, I, I write here friend or foe. Uh, for, uh, I mean, there is an entire area where you want to have CPG uh, oligos to, to modulate the immune system, uh, but for ASOS, et cetera, and, and sRNA and so on, uh, it's not really, uh, what, you, what you're after, unless that's you want to have a pro-inflammatory boost. Uh, there are ways around this. It's about avoiding uh, the known CPG motifs and also uh, chemical modifications like me methylation of cytosines that dampen the immune, re uh, immune response. But there can be sequences that actually can be pro-inflammatory anyway. So that's really about the screening. One consequence of a pro-inflammatory effect is thrombocytopenia. Uh, this was reported some time ago uh, in the clinic for three different ASOs. Uh, it has been known for quite some time that in non-human primates that you can have uh, both more modus, but also uh, some cases of severe thrombocytopenia in monkeys. But until 2016, it had never been seen in, the, uh, in clinical studies. Uh, there were two compounds then at relatively high doses that, that showed a few cases of thrombocytopenia that uh, got a lot of attention. There was also a splice modulating ASO person that has shown this in young boys. Uh, there's been a lot of, of in, uh, mechanistic investigations around this, and, and it's quite clear that uh, there's a strong immune component to this. 
even though the exact molecular mechanisms have, have not yet been elucidated. Uh, risk uh, mitigation is really monitoring about platelet counts uh, uh, over time uh, in the clinical studies. Uh, and some of the risk factors that have been uh, described is really high dose uh, sequence specific factors because there are many several ASOs uh, that have been given at uh, the same dose levels that have not panned out to, to, to show uh, any thrombocytopenia. Uh, and there are also patient population and genetic factors playing a role here. Uh, time flies. Uh, so I just want to show here that here's then a paper from, uh, from Roche where uh, they, they uh, uh, look at some of the platelet activation um, platelet activation assays, as well as inflammatory effects, uh, and just having the same sequence, uh, but just the PS backbone, you get quite strong responses in several parameters, including uh, the inflammation. But if you add LNA to, uh, to, the, uh, to the same sequence, you actually dampen these effects. So it's not only sequence, but also chemistry. So these ribose modifications can really dampen the, uh, some of the pro-inflammatory effects, not only the methylation or cytosine. So moving more into the liver toxicity here, uh, sorry for running close to the hour here. I, I will soon wrap it up here. Uh, so this graph uh, uh, is just to illustrate, is an experiment where they ran a number of ASOs for the same target, uh, demonstrating that uh, the liver toxicity that you see is not uh, driven by the primary target knockdown or the liver concentration per se. I will not go through all this here, but it's, I think it's quite convincing. You, in this set of examples, you have high concentration giving no uh, liver tox, uh, low concentration giving liver tox, high knockdown or low knockdown giving all different kinds of variations. So I think this is, is, is quite important to remember. There's something else. Chemistry is one thing. Uh, here's a paper from 2007 from Ionis where they compared the Mo chemistry and the LNA. Uh, I think it's from the same sequence. Uh, you get more potent knockdown with the LNA, but also a higher degree of liver toxicity. So you don't gain much there. Uh, so the safety margin is not improved. Uh, further experiments uh, have demonstrated that uh, with the same sequence, and if you put the, in the wings, you have Mo, Ciet, or Fluoro, or LNA, you have a range of different toxicities where in this Gapmer context, the Fluoro gives the, uh, the highest, um, highest liver toxicity, whereas the Mo is, is, is staying safe. And the Ciet and LNA is somewhere in between. Uh, Role of RNAs H, i.e. the effector enzyme in, in GAPMERS. Uh, there have been several experiments here where uh, RNAs H had been knocked out. Uh, and uh, uh, also they have been assessed whether you have a lot of the number of transcripts being affected. And this one is from Sebastian Burrell uh, and also from Martin Dickmann. Uh, this is uh, Ionis and Roche, where they look at the number of transcripts. Uh, and Safe ASOs have fewer transcripts affected, toxic have more transcripts affected. Uh, and when you knock down the RNAs H, you actually uh, remove the toxicity. Uh, so this would indicate that RNAs H dependent off target could be a mechanism. I will actually skip this one. Uh, so coming to this here about the chemistry, a series of paper again from, from Ionis. Uh, I looked into the chemistry of the ribose modifications, looking at the hydrophobicity, uh, and they looked for a given sequence, but with different uh, 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 ribose modifications, that you have differences in protein affinity of intracellular proteins, where the fluoro and the LNA is being more hydrophobic than uh, the Mo chemistry, which uh, in uh, some instances actually uh, correlate them with toxicity. So it's not only the, the chemistry, but also the sequence. So given a uh, given chemical design, and you alter the sequence, you can have a different uh, different effect on the protein bindings uh, as well. So what does that have to do with toxicity? So in in uh, some recent paper, again from from the Crook Lab at Ionis, uh, they looked at at uh, certain sequences that are toxic, 
and, and managed to identify some of, of, of proteins uh, that interacted with uh, uh, strongly with uh, with these toxic azos, uh, depleting them. And it's actually uh, in both uh, uh, chemistry with the fluoro being the most toxic, uh, deplete these uh, P54 uh, protein and PSF proteins. But there are also sequences with the fluorochemistry that uh, do not deplete these and are safe. This uh, really comes down to that, that screening uh, within a given chemistry. Screening is really, really important to identify the right sequence. Uh, and I think this is my last slide before the wrap up here. So they took this further and, and could identify that uh, for a given chemistry, if you replace uh, the DNA, uh, the PS uh, DNA in, in the gapmer with the O-methyl in position two, that actually you could, you, you could convert a, a toxic uh, ASO to, to a safe ASO. This has also, uh, an analog uh, to this has been described for siRNA, where some of the liver toxicity was uh, 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 dependent on off-target effects. If you kind of would destabilize some, uh, uh, just one nucleotide in the, in the uh, antisense strand with a, a more lower affinity nucleotide, for example, GNA, you could actually also convert a toxic uh, sequence to, to a safe sequence. So I think these examples really show that there's so much more to discover here to, to, to uh, improve the safety of, uh, uh, of the ASOS screening but also very clever uh, chemical design where to, to place these modifications uh, throughout the sequence. So uh, that brings me to the end. Apologies for running over. Uh, so um, yeah, assessment of principles follows more molecular approach. We have consistent, relatively consistent safety pattern within oligo class. I mainly talked about PSA source, uh, means that we know what to screen for. Sometimes you need to screen a lot. Um, Toxicity mechanisms involve both chemistry and sequence, uh, and the recent improvements in the mechanistic understanding are very, very promising. And I would have to say it's very fun to be a toxicologist in these days with a lot more understanding coming up. So um, thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. Right. Thank you very much. That was, you know, very, very, um, very good talk. A um, bit past, a bit um, too much for me. But um, because I'm, 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 you know, a molecular biologist. But um, yeah, very interesting. Uh, there have been quite a lot of questions, so okay, I'll, I'll go back to where the first questions were. Okay. Oh yeah, someone wanted to know if you would make the slides available. Um, yes. Yeah. Okay. I, I can download them and then I'll, I'll put them on the website as well. <clears throat> yeah. Uh -huh. Regarding compound safety, do you refer to API only or impurities too? If impurities considered, are they assessed separately or with API from Kui Yang? Hmm. Uh, this is really the API. I'm uh, talking about uh, since this is uh, uh, really uh, focusing on identifying the right sequence and chemistry. The impurities then come and they will differ depending on your, your uh, synthesis route. Uh, and I think that's an area of itself. But obviously, I mean, if let's say you have some impurities of a certain sequence or chemistry there, these same principles could apply. Uh, hopefully you have such a low concentration of those impurities that they won't be meaningful from, uh, 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 yeah, for example, an uh, off target <coughs> effect. Okay, Ashutus would like to know if design of ASO, how do you do, how do you identify new ASO target sequences? Is it based on existing sRNA target sequences or RNA walk? Um, I mean, with, with, the, with the sequences available, you could uh, identify uh, millions or, or at least several thousands of uh, possible sites where you could target. 
uh, I'm now talking about GAPMERS and SIRNA. However, some of those sites will not be accessible for, for, the, uh, for the ACE or the SIRNA uh, due to protein binding or, or hairpin loops and things like that. Uh, so f my experience is that you kind of take a, a shotgun approach and see, identify areas, regions that are accessible, and then you can um, further walk within, within that uh, region. But that is for potency. Uh, you also need to ensure that those ASOs that may uh, come out of that are to uh, well tolerated. So you need to kind of do the screening of potency and safety almost in parallel. Okay, Mai Ling Li would like to know which chemical modifications are you using? I assume that means AstraZeneca is using. Um, if that's... Uh, if that's confidential yeah, we, information, we then... Yeah, we, we have been collaborating with uh, Ionis, uh, where we're using the C8 chemistry. Then we have Mohamed Shadid asking, what is the average and acceptable safety margin for ASOs? Ooh, uh, I would say that depends very much on uh, the safety finding you have. Uh, as I said, if you can monitor it, if it's reversible, and also what uh, the patient population, i.e. the project context is. If it's just a you know, highly lethal disease, uh, uh, you're only going to treat once, uh, the safety margin can probably be quite small. If it's going to be more chronic uh, treatment for like uh, uh, high uh, LDL cholesterol, like the PCS scanning uh, siRNA, uh, you most likely need to have a very large safety margin. So it's very project, uh, project and toxicity dependent. Okay, the next question is from Karishma Duri. Some ASOs show thrombocytopenia. Do we know the reason for this yet? Um, I have a quick note for that because I've seen a uh, preprint paper that um, might be helping with uh, the answer to that. So I'll just put the link in. Good. But, uh, there, are, there have been presentations around this and, and also uh, a few publications uh, around more mechanistic investigations. Uh, uh, and uh, I think uh, I could also put some uh, references, uh, a list of ref useful references. Uh, add that to the end of the, my, my slides. That'd be great. If you send that to me, I'll, I'll put it on the website as well. Um, and I'll pull out. Yes, I will. I'll pull out the references from your talk as well. Um, yeah. Okay. Another question from Ashutosh: If AstraZeneca is doing a screen for new ASO, what scale are we talking about? Are you screening, say, a hundred per target or a thousand per target? Uh, we <laughs> have so far been collaborating with other companies. So, uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, we you you need to screen more than ten in order to come up with good but I cannot talk about how many. Yeah, I believe Ionis generally screen like hundreds. Yeah, it's, it's, it's quite many. Um, Constantine, I'm sorry if I mangle your name, Yadwell, are there known conjugate driven safety issues? How do you assess them? In principle, it's, it's about the... Uh, how you assess any drug candidate, uh, it is uh, give, I mean, the, the drug as such is either the, uh, the siRNA or ASO with the conjugate or uh, for Ompatro, it's the siRNA in the formulation. So you, as you safety assess that uh, as a whole a unity. So it's nothing different really in principles uh, if you have a non-conjugated ASO or a conjugated ASO. Uh, of course, the safety findings and, and dose levels and safety margins can be different, but the principle that you need to test in rodents and non-rodents and for on-target safety and chemistry safety, et cetera, are, are the same. They could obviously be uh, conjugate specific uh, um, considerations. For example, if you are, lucky enough to come up with a, a, a conjugate that would target your ASO to, uh, let's say, um, 
a, a cardiomyocyte. Uh, then suddenly you would, uh, if you do that in an efficient way, you would end up in, in your tox studies with that uh, uh, conjugate, you would end up with a lot higher concentration of the ASO in cardiomyocytes than you can reach with non-conjugated ASOs. Uh, since nobody has ever bef before described high concentration cardiomyocyte toxicity, you may end up in, in, in novel findings. But the principles of how you do it uh, uh, is, and how you approach it is, is, about, is the same. Okay, we have another question from Ashutosh. When working with ASO in vitro cell culture models, does fetal calf serum affect the stability of the ASOs? Hmm. I am not an in vitro person myself. Uh, depend, I would say it depends on the uh, chemistry. Uh, my understanding is that um, the more heavily modified ASOs, they are quite stable in, in, in cell culture as well. Uh, but of course, if you have different chemistries or non, uh, not even a phosphothyroid backbone, it could be a different thing. Yeah, maybe I should quickly answer that because um, I certainly have experience yes, with that. Yes. Uh, yes, definitely. If you do not have chemical modification, then your the fetal calf serum will destroy your oligo. Um, if you have PSO, um, maybe MOE, then that would definitely protect your oligo for the whatever long you use for the transfection. If you do use transfection or gymnosis, um, I believe Ione is generally do test the oligos with gymnosis, i.e. they just add the oligo without a transfection reagent. If you use a transfection reagent such as lipofectamine, then um, the lipofectamine would certainly protect the oligo as well from the fetal calf serum. Okay, then... We have a question from Shipra Malik. How is the efficient efficacy impacted with combining PS and LNA modifications? Uh, the PS backbone uh, is, I would say, independent from the LNA. But of course, when you combine it, in, uh, it will give you higher affinity to your target, uh, i.e. higher potency. Uh, it will also, uh, depending on where you put your LNAs, uh, it will give you more increased nuclease resistance. So if you, in the case of a Gapmer, put it on the ends of the, of the ASO, the exonucleases will be quite, uh, have a tough job to me metabolize the ASO. So in case of Gapmers with uh, uh, nuclease resistant modifications, is mainly endonucleases cutting in the middle. Uh, that you will have. So it will increase the affinity and, and the nuclease resistance if you have LNAs, but depends on where you put your LNAs. Okay, <clears throat> question from Alex Garanto. Nice talk, Patrick. You mentioned that using published and unpublished data, companies are designing ASOs and modeling safety profiles. In the area of open access science, are these modeling predictions going to be publicly available? There have been some papers, I would say mainly from uh, Roche, uh, where they talk about uh, properties and, and, and I think also from Pfizer about sequence motifs uh, uh, that are more common in liver toxic uh, uh, ASOs. Uh, I hope that there will be a sharing of data, but I guess you can imagine that if if a company uh, managed to come up with a very robust uh, in, in silico prediction of toxicity, that is, uh, would help them tremendously in developing new, new sequences. So I could imagine that that would, uh, at least the details of that, would not be published. Uh, but that's just an, uh, perhaps an unfair assumption. Okay, a question from Yvonne van Gessel. Great talk. If the candidate ASO is active in non-human primates, is a GLP study with a rodent surrogate still needed or required for hybridization-dependent toxicity? If you can demonstrate that your, uh, your uh, human candidate ASO is active in any of the preclinical species you run in your GLP st uh, tox studies, uh, then you don't need a surrogate. Uh, however, I would say if you aim to uh, knock down the target to, let's say, 70% in, 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 in the patients, if you would only reach 50% in your TOC studies uh, knocked down, uh, I, I wouldn't say that you have uh, assessed on-target safety with that. So you need to go 
to the same noct uh, pharmacology level or uh, ideally beyond that in order to assess the on-target safety. So it depends on, on how a specific sequence behaves in, uh, uh, in the monkey or the rodent, I would say, whether uh, you need a, a surrogate or not. Okay, the next question is from Fabrice Leclerc. What is the relative toxicity depending on phosphorocyanate, stereochemistry, RPS, SPS, or RPS plus SPS? Uh, yeah, I know this has been a question of debate for, for some years now. Uh, and I think there has been some really nice data from uh, showing that uh, for a given chemistry, uh, or oh, sorry, for a given sequence, that uh, the stereochemistry can have an effect on both uh, stability, potency, uh, and, and also the safety. Uh, I think the challenge is really to combine all three of those in one molecule and also to come up with uh, rules uh, uh, so you don't need to test uh, a number of those stereochemistry variants <coughs> per sequence. That can obviously be, uh, let's say if you have um, uh, if you have a sequence that is super potent and otherwise well behaving and you would like to perhaps, you know, dial down the toxicity, uh, for example, then I think playing around with the stereochemistry in that sequence can be one way of doing it. Uh, but also there are these other approaches that uh, Anilam and, and uh, uh, Ionis have been describing where they had sprinkle some uh, more lower affinity modifications in the gap region uh, or throughout the, uh, 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 the antisense strand. So, so there are uh, so I think that uh, the stereochemistry could be one way of uh, uh, modulating an otherwise you know nice uh, uh, sequence. Uh, but, but again, the, the challenge is uh, to, to really combine all properties in one uh, in one uh, molecule, and that's that's not trivial. Um, Alex, a follow-up question from earlier. Going into more details on my previous question about the modeling, what are the most important parameters they are using to model? Alex, I don't think we're going to get any answers to that. No. Uh, sequ sequence, yes, uh, for sure. But in order to do modeling for that, you need to have a huge data set. And, and uh, that requires a lot of resources to generate. So um, it's not that many that can probably make such robust and, and, and very predictive uh, modeling uh, as of today. Okay, Brahim, I'm just going to type the link in. That's the YouTube channel. You can find all the webinars on there, but also typically the recordings will be available from the same page that you signed up on, on the OTS website. And we add the references and sometimes the slides if the speaker agree to that page as well. Okay. Uh, from Vladimir Pablo Martinez, uh, I had some issues with the sound. Okay, yes, we, we the recording will be available, hopefully tomorrow, but it might be two or three days. Uh -huh. Can you include a screening funnel in your slide deck with focus on safety related steps? Okay. I, don't know if that's uh, asking a bit much, seeing as uh, Patrick already spent quite a lot of time preparing this. Yeah, and again, it's um, I'm aware of some screening funnels, but uh, these things are um, quite project or sorry, company bespoke in a way. So I'm not really sure how much I could reveal there. But uh, let, let's say I mean my the principles of going starting in vitro. And then dialing down to 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 in vivo uh, both acute and and repeat uh, dose rodent studies uh, and with some in vitro assessments. I mean th that's kind of the principle. But the details of a screening funnel, of course, I know that most people would probably love to to uh, to see that, but um, um, I'm afraid I cannot uh, give that. Um, I do think we yeah. have a webinar, uh, one of the talks from the educational session with, I think, Sabine Suing from Roche, I believe, mm. um, that she talks a little bit about how they handle this. Yeah. Yeah. 
Fabricio Fabiano, how much are RNA binding proteins involved in the preclinical safety assessment? Are there in silico or in vitro approaches to exclude interaction with unwanted RBPs, which could sequester the therapeutic oligos? That's a great question. I think uh, given the recent publications of the importance of uh, ACE or uh, say, yeah, ASO and um, protein interaction, I think that's probably where we're going. Uh, however, with the sequence uh, dependency in this, uh, there will, uh, I mean, for some sequences, there will not, will not be a protein interaction, even if you have the same chemistry. Uh, so until uh, you, there has been a pinpointing of some really key protein ASO interactions that uh, occur in almost all toxic one uh, toxic uh, um, uh, sequences. Uh, I think it yeah it will hopefully come, but uh, I am not aware of any kind of screening steps for this. But it's it's a great idea, and I think. Uh, or perhaps five years from now, uh, such assays are available. Okay, a um, question from Paul Vogel. Is there any toxicity tendency in ASO type? I'm not entirely sure that that is quite clear what the question is. Do SRN tend mm -hmm. to be more toxic than RNAsH oligos? I think in, in general, given the phosphothyronate backbone, which is really essential for single stranded ASOs, uh, I, what I talked about here today was uh, uh, the safety findings that can occur with single stranded, given that much of that is driven by the PS backbone. The siRNAs have much fewer PS linkages uh, and they act have a different mechanisms. So, uh, Things like thrombocytopenia, uh, injection site reactions are not commonly found with siRNAs based on uh, the clinical studies I have seen data on. Uh, so uh, these things are more common for, for ASOs. Uh, that said, uh, in the kind of screening uh, for, for siRNAs, there are liver toxicities uh, happening there as well. Uh, and uh, some recent papers have, have demonstrated that that is mainly due to uh, to off-target events in the seed sequence that can be uh, mitigated. Uh, but uh, so, so screening has to be done also for siRNAs for, for safety, even though the type of, of endpoints uh, may differ where there are uh, more uh, findings that normally uh, that often are seen with a, a PS backbone ASOs than, uh, than siRNA. Okay, <clears throat> Francesca Rossiello. Following up on Paul Fogel's question, what about blocking ASOs versus gap mass? I imagine it means about toxicity. Toxicity. Uh, I would say that um, uh, this is a question that has come up in, in several uh, discussions and groups I've participated in. And if the mechanism is, like, say, RNAs H dependent off target uh, with a, a cleavage of uh, unintended uh, uh, mRNAs, if you don't have that catalytic function, uh, uh, then of course you will not have that toxicity uh, with the steric blockers. Uh, however, for these more uh, things that could be driven by uh, protein ASO interactions, uh, I would say that's probably more sequence and chemistry dependent. In fact, one of uh, uh, one of those ASOs that uh, demonstrate almost all of the uh, described class effects uh, is Drisa person, which is a uh, 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 steric blocking ASOs, uh, where we had uh, kidney toxicity, <coughs> thrombocytopenia, pro-inflammatory effects, etc. So I think it's. Uh, more really um, depends on what toxicity you, you, you're looking at. But I do not think that the steric blockers are, are free from, uh, uh, from toxicities in, 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 uh, in any way. I know also that several of the steric blockers are not using phosphothyroid backbone, it's more neutral backbone. So of course, then you will not have the PS backbone driven effects. But again, it comes down to the safety margin. It's more difficult, uh, perhaps you need to dose much higher and then other things could kick in. So it's it's about the efficacy safety ratio, the safety margin. That's uh, really what counts. 
Okay, then uh, last question from Giuseppina Covello. Which the safety modifications do you think are useful for ASO to inject into the brain area? Ooh, um, that's a good one. Uh, I have not worked in that area myself, so I cannot really answer, but uh, uh, of course, the, it's a different dis type of distribution into the brain uh, and uh, um, the effect duration even for single-stranded ASOs can be very, very long. Uh, so I guess the turnover of ASOs is, is quite different within, behind the blood-brain barrier uh, than outside in the sy systemic. Um, I haven't really seen any publications on uh, uh, CNS delivered uh, toxicity, so I unfortunately I cannot answer that. Yes, as I should have said, um, Ionis does publish quite a lot on, on the sort of chemistry, so that might be worth a look. Um, mm. Yes, yeah, thank you very much for everyone for attending. I think uh, we've been overrunning quite a bit, so it might be time to shut it down. Uh, just a quick reminder that we'll have um, the next webinar will be on the 10th of June with Carl Armilon, also from AstraZeneca, and he is going to talk to us about why PKPD is important for oligo development. And also tomorrow we have an Autism Journal Club. Journal clubs will not be recorded, so if you want to listen to the presentation, you have to be there. And that would be Professor Haifang Yen from Tianjin University. And please note the time is 9 o'clock UTC. Um, you can see all the details on the Otis Journal Club website. Um, please keep an eye on the Otis website for updates or follow us on social media at OTA, OT Society on Twitter. And you can find other interesting webinars, award lectures, and education sessions from the annual meetings on our YouTube channel, that, the link I posted that earlier. So hopefully we all see you uh, next time with uh, Carla Amelon. And thank you very much, Patrick. That was uh, really great. Um, you made this really understandable for someone like me, who's more sort of a molecular biologist. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, thank you, and apologies again for running over. No, no, I think it was it was well worth listening to, even if it was slightly longer than usual. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Bye, Bye -bye, everyone. everyone.